Alrighty, wonderful. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to Pre-Health Shadowing. Thank you all for joining me today. Pre-Health Shadowing is an international student-led, woman-led, uh, nonprofit organization uh, for medical advancement. So just a couple of things before we begin. If anybody is looking for a mentor, we actually have some virtual mentorship connection opportunities for you. This is a wonderful chance um, to gain a virtual mentor for life that can guide you through uh, your journey, not only uh, the short term, like uh, you know, applying for different programs, but your long term, making connections with people who can potentially match you in any residency programs, potentially looking for a fellowship. Like these are all the connections that you can make now. Um, and so the only way to attend our mentorship networking event is by invite. Uh, so the way to get an invitation is to enter in our raffle. We will be giving away uh, invitations to students. Um, and so today uh, you guys can get in. It's $3 per uh, raffle ticket. You can submit as many as you'd like. Um, there's two ways that you can send in your raffle submission. Uh, the first way is by PayPal. The second way is Venmo. You can do at PreHealth Shun PayPal or Venmo, $3 per ticket. This is to secure a spot in our mentorship networking event, which will take place on February 19 to 21. And all of the winners will be announced at the end of today's session. We do have closed captioning to accommodate students of all abilities and needs. If you guys have any ideas of how we could be more accessible, um, you can email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Because pre-health shadowing is online and has given us the opportunity to connect with students, not only within the US, but all over the world, go ahead and drop in the chat where you guys are Zooming from today. Time to represent. Awesome, welcome everybody. All right, if you guys wanna stay in the loop, we actually are having a virtual shadowing session every single day of the week. Um, until June. So if you guys want to get in on this, never miss a virtual shadowing session, you can sign up for our email list. You can do this by going onto our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash join us and putting in your email. You're also going to want to make sure that it bypasses the junk and the spam and the promotions folder. So the way that you're going to do this, listen up, this is a really big deal. You're going to want to uh, put the email uh, as important. So Anytime you'll get an email from Prehealth Shadowing, it'll be important. You can also save us as a contact, and this will also ensure that it goes directly to your inbox. If it doesn't go to your inbox, chances are you won't see it until it's too late, which is a little unfortunate. You guys can also follow us on social media. We do post all of our virtual shadowing sessions on there as well. All right, we have some wonderful opportunities. So part of being a student with pre-health shadowing is that you guys get perks. So the first perk is that we have partnered with Kaplan to give you a 10% off uh, discount to any Kaplan course. So all you have to do is fill out our survey and you will get 10% off any Kaplan course. Not only will you get that, but you'll also get free study guides for a bunch of these standardized tests that you guys will have to take to go into your next stage of schooling. So this is wonderful. I know I'm on a budget and I'm assuming I'm not the only one. So if you guys are looking um, for any free resources, this is a wonderful one. They have all of the information is laid out for you. Our second opportunity is with Fem Health, And so the Fem Health Summit is a year long membership to gain insight about different uh, fields within uh, healthcare, within leadership, leadership and healthcare. Um, and so these are 19 women. Uh, some are owners and founders of multi-million dollar companies. And one of them was even on Shark Tank. Um, so learn more about this. You can click the link that was just sent in the chat and I hope to see you there. All right, if you guys aren't feeling the 10% discount on um, Kaplan or uh, you guys uh, aren't really sure about paying the, the discounted price for Fem Health Summit, we, we have scholarships for both of those. Um, so you guys can enter in either of these scholarships um, by either submitting a uh, written document, 350 words or less, or a two minute video submission answering those three questions below. Um, for Kaplan, uh, the only difference is how will Kaplan help you? Um, and so you submit these, uh, we will be announcing this during our live session. Uh, be sure to be following us on Instagram for more information. We'll leave this up for one more second. Feel free to take a picture of this if you need. Alrighty. 
We've partnered with the woman-led organization Mask for Mask, which for every four masks that are purchased from their website, four masks will get donated to someone in need. This might be um, a hospital that is lacking in resources or someone in the homeless community or really just anybody who cannot provide for themselves during this ongoing global pandemic. So they have a bunch of really cute designs. Um, you can get this as a present for yourself or for your friends. You can also get 15% off your order with the code PHS15. Not only are you helping Mask for Mask and donating masks to people in need, but you're also donating 10% of those proceeds to pre-health shadowing to keep uh, virtual shadowing free and accessible for everybody everywhere. Check them out, maskformask.com. If you guys are interested in being a part of pre-health shadowing, we are a student-based, student-led organization. You can sign up on our website to become a student volunteer. Uh, these are very flexible opportunities, anywhere from one hour to as many hours as you'd like um, during the week. If you can't commit every single week, that's totally fine okay as well. You guys can make your own schedule. We have asynchronous opportunities. If you're looking for a leadership position, you guys can be a part of our international organization where we are leading a team of over 20,000 students on their journeys to become healthcare professionals. Check us out on our website. If you're a high school student, listen up, I do have opportunities for you as well. Pre-Health Shadowing is offering an HTP team, which is a leadership healthcare education for pre-collegiate learners. You guys will be able to establish Pre-Health Shadowing as a club on multiple campuses across the US. You get to meet with like-minded students that are interested in going into the healthcare field just like you. So if you guys are interested, you can apply on our website. If you're looking to get published, Pre-Health Shadowing also has that opportunity for you. Um, so you can submit your writing to prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. If you're interested, please click the link that was just sent or take a picture because you cannot access this from the website. You have to be watching this video to know about this opportunity. So you can type this into your URL. You can submit any piece of work. Our editor in chief will be in contact with you um, about ways that um, you can expand ways that you can really encapsulate this meaning so that you can create and publish something uh, and put this on your application, your CV, your resume, your LinkedIn, wherever your heart desires, um, all right here, pre-health shadowing. Alrighty, uh, if you are financially able to donate at this time, uh, please do so. We are a student-based, student-led nonprofit organization, uh, and we are working to fight inequity in health education and promote diversity in the various fields during this ongoing global pandemic. Um, if you guys can, if everybody in this live session was able to donate $1 today, that would uh, potentially pay our website for the next week or so. Um, we are uh, increasing our student load and because of that, uh, it does cost a lot of money to keep our website up and to keep our booking um, expenses and our Zoom and all of that together. And so we really do humbly ask you guys to donate if you can. If you are financially unable to donate at this time, we completely understand. Um, we are living through a global crisis. Please just send this to somebody who you think would be able to donate um, and help us. Thank you so much. All right, throughout the duration of today's session, feel free to type your questions in the chat. Our co-hosts will ask them during the Q&A portion, which is during the second half of today's virtual shadowing session. I encourage you to take good notes because there will be a post shadowing assessment that will be available at the end of today's virtual shadowing session. This will be 10 questions and I'll go more in depth at the end. You will have two tries to get over a 70% uh, to get your post shadowing certificate. So I encourage you guys to take good notes, ask good questions. Uh, this is a real privilege that we have to be spending this time with an established professional. Utilize this. Alrighty, last slide. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on. Uh, we're trying to make this as close to in-person shadowing as possible. Um, although it's not always possible, if it is, we do encourage it. Uh, this is like our human contact for the day. So I, I'll have my camera on. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our professional for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Doc. And it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. What a great intro. You guys are doing a really good job. Um, I am calling in from just outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I saw some other individuals from Pennsylvania are also on this. 
So without further ado, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, being an optometrist, a doctor of optometry or an optometric physician, all the same name. Uh, sometimes it depends on what state you're practicing in as to what title you can use. I'm just letting you know that I am presenting this independently. I am a faculty member at one of the optometry schools. Uh, and with that, I just want you to know that this is my own personal opinion and it doesn't have to do with any affiliation of my institution or any organization that I am also a member of. Uh, also, I haven't received any financial compensation for the presentation and the photos are either of personal patients of mine or with my residents and or from reference websites. Those um, are tagged at the bottom of each of the photos. So I'm going to start by talking about my own personal background. We'll then go on and talk about optometry. We'll talk about the overview of optometry. Uh, I put in three cases uh, and we're not gonna go too in depth on them, but just to kind of show you a little bit of the thought process and the differential diagnosis that we can come up with as we think our way through those cases. And then I'll talk a little bit about optometry school. So about me, uh, I grew up outside Scranton, Pennsylvania, made famous by the office. Uh, I now have relocated to the Philadelphia suburbs. I've been in this area since 2006 when I started optometry school, so I'm dating myself a little bit. Uh, in high school, I was very involved in every single extracurricular you could possibly imagine. Uh, school wasn't as difficult for me. I really liked the sciences. I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. I ended up going to uh, Penn State University where I applied as a chemistry major because I really liked chemistry in my junior year of high school. And then when I was there, I was thinking to myself, scheduling classes, maybe I just don't want to only do chemistry. Let me do science. I ended up taking a bunch of science courses my very first semester when I was there and there were about 700 kids in each of my classes and again wasn't really crazy about just taking all of these different sciences didn't really have a good mix. I then moved on and did not declare I was undecided at the time and I took an entire semester of elementary education. So everyone in my family was an educator and I was like, okay, that seems to work out. I like working with children. And one of the classes that I took um, really talked about the different pedagogies and the government involvement in the classroom. And that is what made me decide, no, definitely don't wanna do this. And I was still kind of really interested in the sciences and did more research. And I ended up settling on something called biobehavioral health. At the time, it was somewhat of a new major. It really is a health profession major. And it is um, more of like an interdisciplinary where it ends up looking at biology. It looks at behavioral aspects, physiology, socioeconomic status, hereditary aspects, and how that all comes together to factor into um, disease states and the likelihood of your health over your entire lifetime. And I really felt as though that helped to prepare me ultimately when I was applying to optometry school and even in optometry school, especially with the doctor-patient relationship. Because I didn't have a strict science undergrad, um, I ended up utilizing our pre-professional committee. And that pre-professional committee ended up writing me a letter of recommendation as a whole from Penn State. From the pre-professional committee, though, I did have to uh, supply them with three letters of recommendation from my instructors. The reason that I chose to go through the pre-professional committee is that I didn't feel as though I had good personal connections with three strict science instructors or professors. So by going through the pre-professional committee, I could have one science and then two of my biobehavioral health. So that is the one thing that I'm going to talk about towards the end is most of us, you know, when you're looking into professional school, medical school, PA school, um, you do really well in your science classes. You're probably getting A's, A minuses, B plus that you don't really feel as though you're struggling. And I didn't really go to office hours. So I didn't have that connection in order for those instructors to be able to write me more personal letters of recommendation. So just keep that in mind. My extracurriculars activities or extracurricular activities in college. Um, I was involved in dance marathon that raised money for pediatric cancer. I ended up having a captain position with multiple students uh, on my committee. There were 40 students that were on my committee. That really was kind of the extent of my involvement because it did take a 20 to 30 hours per week. 
And the other thing that I did as I was preparing to apply to professional school was I spent the summer between junior and senior year uh, shadowing an optometrist, one to make sure that it was something that I was interested in. The other was to also have somebody that could act as a mentor. And then finally, they also offered to write me a letter of recommendation, which also made a difference in just um, showing that you have this commitment that you want to really be involved in the future that you've kind of put in your time in shadowing and uh, gaining some of that even uh, experience from a, an entry level. I then applied to the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. It was the only optometry school that I applied to. Being a Pennsylvania girl, when you ask other optometrists in Pennsylvania, where did you go? Everyone says PCO. I didn't really want to leave the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was convenient. I also liked that their concentration was really ocular disease. At the time, it was only a four-year program, so I graduated in 2010, and while I was at PCO, I was part of student council, I was president of our executive council, and uh, got to be really part of an interesting aspect when we went from a flagship college of PCO to a university. We became Salus University with PCO serving as that flagship, and now we have other colleges also located within the university. I chose to do a residency in primary care ocular disease at the Eye Institute. It is the teaching uh, clinic associated with the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. You do not have to do a residency in optometry. Um, a vast majority of the residencies are 52 to 54 weeks uh, to really get more in-depth learning. There is one two-year residency and that's a neuropthalmic disease. From there, our patient base is really um, exciting in that it pushed me to my limits every day. It made me a better clinician, uh, ordering blood work, ordering MRIs, teaching the students. It was going to be hard for me to go somewhere else uh, and really be challenged. And that is why I applied to Sayon as a faculty member. So I've currently been a faculty member at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salus University uh, for the past eight or nine years. And because in all my free time and you never stop learning, I'm currently working on a master's degree in pharmacology and toxicology at Michigan State University. And that is to help build my um, kind of background because of the dif different teachers, I'm sorry, different courses that I teach, uh, but also just an interest. So um, I am planning to graduate next spring uh, with an additional degree uh, that helps to uh, also build my CV a little bit. So I do a lot of continuing education lectures for other optometrists, especially in pharmacology, uh, because of that. So my typical day is I don't have a typical day. It changes from day to day, and that is, it's just because of being a faculty member. Most times what we do is we break our days down into two different sessions. It's eight to 12 and then one to five. So you have different responsibilities as part of this. You can be in clinic, you can lecture, you can also be in lab. We also have other small group classes, uh, specifically at PCO, we call them clinical problem solving, where you're presented with cases and you talk about the different aspect of those cases. Uh, including socioeconomic status, is there um, uh, deterrent to entry as far as being able to enter into the healthcare system. It's not just about here's the eye, here's the diagnosis, here's the treatment. It's really looking at every single aspect of the different case to help you grow as a clinician. So I serve as a clinical attending or a preceptor in the clinic three days a week. Right now, my schedule is Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, my favorite place to be in clinic is in our walk-in emergency or urgency clinic because you never know what's going to come in. It can be something as minor as just a red eye and they have allergies, or it can be something like I saw on Monday that someone was rejecting their corneal transplant. Um, I end up writing for a decent amount of oral medications and topical ophthalmic medications, also known as eye drops. Um, and I get to work with our residents very closely and help them grow in uh, expanding their knowledge base and their treatment and 
and management modalities. I also serve as a primary care attending where uh, we work with our students. So our students perform eye exams top to bottom. That includes dilation where we put in dilating drops, open up the pupils nice and big, check the back health of the eye with lights and lenses. Um, again, that is the teaching experience where you're walking in through every part of the exam and teaching them how to build their clinical thought process. I also lecture on ocular pharmacology. We talk a lot about topical ophthalmic eye drops, but we also talk about oral medications because sometimes oral medications have systemic side effects and they also have ocular side effects, but also topical ophthalmic drops can also have systemic side effects. And then I also teach in our ophthalmic lasers and minor surgical procedures course. In certain states in the United States, uh, optometrists do have ophthalmic laser rights. Now, this is not what you're thinking as far as refractive surgery, so like LASIK. This is behind a slit lamp, which is our, um, uh, it's a really our main tool in how we assess ocular health. It's like a big microscope. You can end up attaching lasers or that the, and a laser can be attached to it uh, and that they're minimally invasive. Other minor surgical procedures include usually when we say about lumps and bumps around the eye or of the lid itself. This is really what the discernment is between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. I will usually say that an ophthalmologist is a more in-depth surgeon. They are the ones that are doing refractive laser procedures like LASIK or something called PRK, photorefractive keratectomy. Um, there's a new procedure um, that is currently being also utilized. Uh, that's a little bit of an update of those refractive procedures. Cataract surgery that your grandparents might be getting. Uh, individuals who have glaucoma, which is a mismatch of pressure inside the eye and what's healthy for the optic nerve, if they need incisional surgery associated with that. So I will usually say that that's the biggest difference between optometrists and ophthalmologists is that ophthalmologists are going to be your subspecialist surgeons. And then in lab, there's clinical skills lab. So teaching you how to perform the eye exam, teaching you how to build your armament of tasks and skills in order to be able to perform certain tests to garner more in-depth um, diagnoses. And then I also teach that uh, for ophthalmic lasers and minor surgical procedures. We do have lasers that we utilize as far as um, using different type of uh, simulation eyes and the same thing for minor surgical procedures. We end up teaching suturing and lump and bump removal, different type of injections also as part of that skill. So you can see that my day changes. Um, it depends on what day of the week it is. It depends on what semester or quarter we're in as far as what my typical day looks like. But I will tell you, being a faculty member, it's not usually an eight to five and you're done. Uh, I record lectures for our students. We have faculty meetings. You're expected to work on publications, uh, present at different conferences. I do a lot of CE lectures. So there's a lot of nighttime and weekend hours that also go along with it. So my first question, you guys can choose to answer it if you'd like to just in the chat, is going to be how many people here have had an eye exam? And then if it's, yes, you have had an eye exam, how many people have had an eye exam in the last two years? Let's take a look. Me, good work. Last week. Excellent answers, new glasses last month. So with this, most people that are going to end up going to get their eyes examined, especially when you're in high school and college, are most often gonna see an optometrist. And the reason for that is we're really the primary eye care provider. So it'd be like seeing your family doctor, your primary care physician, um, just for your regular uh, health checkup. So let's talk a little bit about what is an optometrist. This is my favorite definition because if you go and look up what is an optometrist, you will get things all over the place. And a lot of times people think we just do refractions, which is better one or two, which is better one or two. It's the joke that always goes along with it. There's a couple of comedians that have really good skits as far as you know sweating because they don't know the answer. Also, as for a sign up for you guys, if you can't tell the difference, the same is also an answer. So just keep that in mind. It always doesn't have to be one or two. But doctors of optometry, also known as out, uh, doctors of optometry, also known as ODs or optometrists, are America's primary eye care health providers. They're the front line of eye and vision care. They examine, diagnose, treat, and manage diseases and disorders of the eye. 
In addition to providing eye and vision care, they play a major role in individuals' overall health and well-being by detecting systemic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. That's a great definition, but what does it mean? So let's break it down a little bit. So when we say we're the primary eye care providers, a lot of times we're the entry to the ocular health system. So we're looking at eye care. So we're really checking the health of the eye. That can be the front surface of the eye or the front half of the eye. That's the anterior segment and the posterior segment. Um, so with that, a lot of times I'll see patients that they come in and they might be in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, and they're saying, oh, this is the first time that I've ever had an eye exam. I've never needed glasses. Well, that's good that you might not have a refractive error that you can still see very well. But again, you don't really know if you have an ocular health issue unless you're being assessed or checked. So that's one of the most important things is not only do we check your vision as far as refraction and how well you see, but we also assess the health of the front surface and the back surface of the eye. Uh, vision care is also refractive error. Are you a myope, meaning you're nearsighted? So you see well at near, right? But you look in the distance without any correction and you are blurry. That's a very popular type of refractive error that we see. There's also the opposite where you're farsighted, where you see very well at distance and then in a high prescription, you look up close and you're a little bit blurry. We also have a normal aging change that's called presbyopian individuals that happen around the age of 40, where they start to do the pull away. This might happen in your parents where they're holding things far away from them. Normal aging change that the lens inside the eye can no longer put in enough focusing power. So we help to correct presbyopia. Another aspect of vision care is how the eyes work together. So there's something that's called binocular vision. Can you bring your eyes together and focus at the same point? That's a very important, especially in people who read a lot, in children. There's also an accommodative issue. Can you put in the right focusing power for something that's up close? So all of these are other vision uh, issues that we're also assessing as part of that vision care. The way that we do that is we examine. So we examine the ocular surface with usually a slit lamp. Um, also just grossly looking at the patient. I always say that the exam starts as soon as you greet the patient and you're bringing them back, or it happens as soon as you walk into the room. You are grossly assessing your patient to see, are, are there any abnormalities? In my case, are their eyes level? Does one sit higher than the other? Are their eyes red? Do they have tearing? Do they end up having scars close to their eyes or close or anywhere on their face. Um, when we examine for when we talk about vision disorders, that is usually when we put you behind the big phoropter. Um, and with that, we're usually clicking lenses. And it's not just, you know, there's no rhyme or reason. There's an absolute rhyme or reason when we're going through different lenses correct for different type of refractive errors. We can also use different objective findings to lead us to subjective findings, meaning that's when we're asking you which is better, one or two. We have a little bit of an idea of what you're going to tell us. Uh, we have a good starting point. Diagnosing goes along with your clinical thought process. So from the very beginning, when we take a history to looking at those exam findings to trying to really come up with that diagnosis. And in turn, it then comes to, well, how do we treat you? Is it a glasses prescription? Is it contact lenses? Is it an eye drop that needs to be a prescription eye drop? Is it an oral medication? Is it something that we need to bring you back and do a more in-depth exam, specifically looking to fish out the problem? And then manage it. Do I see you back in a year? Do I see you back in two weeks? Do I see you back tomorrow uh, as part of managing that disease. And then the disorders really go along with, again, those vision disorders that we discussed a little bit before. More importantly, I'm sure you've heard this before. There was an optometrist who spoke, I believe, in, in December. We always say, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul, but it should be more the eyes are the window to the health. So we end up looking at your eyes because they are vascularized, they're optical, they end up showing inflammation, but also in the back of the eye, the retina has blood vessels. In fact, it's the only place in the body that you can directly look at blood vessels. So it reflects what's happening systemically. It's not unusual that optometrists or other eye care providers are um, 
helpful in being one of the first lines to diagnose diabetics. I saw a statistic where 30% of diabetics are actually diagnosed based on an eye exam. We can also see changes in those blood vessels because of changes in blood pressure. So that's also something where we can tell a whole lot what's going on in the body and recommend further testing, follow up with a primary care doctor. Sometimes it's other specialists such as rheumatologists, uh, hematologists. So when we talk about optometry, it really is a part of that interprofessional team of where we need other people um, to really get our patients the care that they need appropriately. So the second question, and I kind of gave you a little bit of a hint before, is what's the main difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist? And you can drop that in the chat if you want to, or just kind of think about that. But again, your biggest discernment is really that ophthalmologists are going to be your surgeons. They are the ones who end up going to medical school. So they're going to be an MD or a DO. Um, so that's an additional four years after undergrad. And then it's, again, residency. So it's usually your year of internship. It's your three-year ophthalmology residency. You can choose, again, to do a fellowship at the completion of that. Most times, what you'll hear about eye care or about the eye itself in medical school is usually about less than two weeks. Um, so really getting that interest in being, oh, do I want to go into ophthalmology happens more so when you're out on your rotations, usually in the last two years of medical school. So just kind of keep that in mind um, where a lot of optometry school is we start talking about the eye literally the very first day. So it's really that concentration on one specific area of the body. So let's talk a little bit about the demographics of the profession itself. Right now, there are more men in the profession um, as compared to women in practice, and that's 53 to 47%. So equaling out a little bit, interestingly enough, the average age of those men is almost a decade older as compared to women. It's not unusual that we also graduate more women, which kind of follows along also with um, all of our other health professions. There are about 20,000 men in practice and about 18,000 women in practice, and the average salary is a little bit less for women. I do want to point out, though, it's not unusual that a lot of people will say, well, optometry is family friendly, it's female friendly, and a lot of times that average salary is less for women because they may not be working full time, uh, that they may be working part time, whether it's anywhere from one to four days a week, and that is usually uh, what's reported as far as the, the difference in the salary is that uh, that average is because it's more often that women aren't working full time because it is more of that family friendly um, profession. Average salary as of 2018 was $127,000. Uh, so it is in that lower six figures. How does that compare to school demographics? You'll see that women are really leading the charge here where it's a little bit over 68% of um, individuals in optometry school are women with 32% of men. That's about 5,000 women total enrollment. So all four years across all the optometry schools in the United States and Puerto Rico. On average, tuition at a public university, so that would be one that is associated with a state university or state institution. So the Ohio State University, SUNY in New York, uh, Indiana, University of Houston, if it's a non-resident, that average tuition per year is about $43,000. Average tuition at a private university, which would be something like PCO at South University in Pennsylvania, ICO in Chicago, Illinois, SCO in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, would be $45,000 approximately. So different practice settings once you're in an, a practicing optometrist, and this is what you're kind of prepping yourself for as you're going through optometry school. Private practice is quite popular. This is where you're running your own business. This can be either solo where you are the head honcho and you are the only optometrist at your practice, or it could be a group practice where you have other optometrists. It can also be a multidisciplinary practice where it's ODMD is usually the terminology that's used, but I also want to acknowledge that other ophthalmologists can also be DO. Uh, so it can be ODDO or ODMD. In some situations, you might also have nurses or PAs as part of that, that that may be assisting the ophthalmologist also in their tasks. 
You can also work in a hospital, whether that is a VA medical center serving our vets or different community clinics. There's also Indian Health Services for um, serving Native Americans. Corporate or retail is what we think of as the big box stores. So that would be your Lens Crafter, that would be your Vision Works, Costco. Uh, and sometimes new grads choose to end up going into corporate because there's no overhead. So you can end up pulling in a six figure paycheck. You can start to pay off your student loans and you're not expected to be on call. You are really going in, you're doing your job and you get to go home at the end of the day. There's also academia, which is me. You can end up teaching students how to become optometrists. And in doing so, you also uh, work in patient care. Again, like I talked about, being in the emergency or urgency service is really my favorite place to be. Uh, and then the last ends up being you can be in the military. So there are scholarships that are available in the Navy, in the Army, um, where you then, it's usually, oh, three years uh, serving at one of their bases. Sometimes it could even be in foreign countries. One thing I did not list on here is that you can also um, be in industry where you can serve as a consultant for industry. So maybe you end up working at one of the major large eye care um, uh, companies, something like Alcon, or even if it's GlaxoSmithKline within their eye care division. So there are other ways. You don't always have to be a practicing optometrist. Johnson & Johnson is another big one. So my third polling question is, do you need a residency to be a practicing optometrist? And hopefully that I kind of clarified that a little bit before. And with that, the answer is no, you do not have to. At this time, um, there are about 470 uh, residencies that are available. Most times, I'm sorry, I skipped that slide. Most times what individuals will do, they end up completing their three or four years of optometry school and they are applying to residencies kind of starting uh, November to February. So now we're doing a bunch of residency interviews, but this is really where you're discovering if you wanna be uh, in a specific niche, do you wanna have a subspecialty with an optometry? So there's primary care, family care, or family practice. There's also ocular disease. That's where you learn uh, and you're exposed to a little bit more in depth of anterior segment disease on the front of the eye, posterior segment disease in the back of the eye, systemic disease overall. There's also cornea and contact lenses. So cornea is going to be the clear covering of the front surface. It's not unusual that you can have specific diseases like keratoconus specifically to that uh, portion of the eye and then specialty contact lenses to kind of help fix those diagnoses. So it's a little bit more in depth than just your regular soft contact lenses that many of you are probably used to where you might replace them daily or every two weeks or every month where these specialty contact lenses Lenses. They're a little bit more rigid. There's something that's called scleral contact lenses. Um, so it's more of a finesse. There's a, a learning process that goes along with uh, really how to fit those special corneas is the best way for me to describe it. There's also a pediatrics and binocular vision residency. So pediatrics is going to be little kids. Binocular vision is how the eyes work together. Uh, so again, I talked a little bit at the beginning about do the eyes come together and focus at the same point? Do they put in the right amount of accommodation or focusing power? Do they have problems tracking that they're struggling in school because of it? And with this, that binocular vision is also usually something called vision therapy. So it's almost like eye exercises, just like you would go to the gym to get your biceps bigger. You can end up going to the eye gym and really work on training your eyes to come together and focus at the same point, to put in the right amount of accommodation, to help them track better. This is not only useful in children, but also in patients after they suffer TBIs or traumatic brain injuries, also in some individuals uh, after they've had a stroke. There's also low vision or vision rehabilitation, individuals that can't see as well, whether that is because of a congenital issue that they are born um, with 
uh, that their eyes end up, I'm going to say that they dance a little bit, but it's called nystagmus. So is that because they uh, end up having albinism, that they just don't have the right anatomical features in order to help them see well? Are there other type of inherited diseases, something like retinitis pigmentosa, that again, they need help? There are different devices that can be prescribed to really improve their quality of life and help them over time. That's also very important in individuals as they age. Uh, you might have heard about macular degeneration, where it's the central point of your vision that you don't see as well. So there are other, uh, other than just congenital diseases, but also as individuals age, that they can also end up benefiting from this service. Community health is usually in community health centers that might go hand in hand with ocular disease. Uh, refractive or ocular surgery where you are helping to co-manage with the ophthalmologist. So that is going to be things like the smile relics procedure, which is the new refractive procedure that I kind of intimated before, or PRK, uh, LASIK is another popular refractive procedure. There are others, but this is where you're working with a surgeon quite closely and you're learning pre-op, so working them up discussing what type of surgery is best for them. Are they the best candidate for one over the other? And then the post-op that goes along with that. And the last is neuropthalmic disease. This is a two-year residency. Uh, right now, neuropthalmic disease is offered at the Eye Institute associated with the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. It is the only two-year residency. Uh, it's very interesting because you end up spending a year of your time also with um, neuro-ophthalmologists and also neurologists, different type of neurologists, learning how to read specific MRIs, CT scans. Uh, so it's not unusual you spend some time at the hospital in addition to also doing more in-depth eye exams on a consult consultation basis. All right, so I'm just going to walk you through three different cases here. So you can see that I kind of started out with just a couple of pictures, uh, and it's just more so to kind of show you what's going on when you're thinking about these cases and when a patient comes in. So on any type of exam, doesn't always have to be an eye exam, but any type of exam, the history is going to be very important. Remember I said that the uh, exam really starts when you're looking at the patient. You're assessing them grossly. If they're walking down the hall, are they holding on to um, the side? Are they bumping into things? Are they being led down the hall by their family member? But not only that, history is going to be consisting of your chief complaint. We really say, what brings you in today? That's their opening chance to tell you what is their problem, what is their main concern. In some instances, they'll say, I'm here because you told me to, I'm here because uh, you told me I had to be seen in a year. Okay, so that can also be a chief complaint. But when someone ends up saying, my eyes are red and watery, Okay, that is their chief complaint. And I will always tell my students that you have to fod Lars the chief complaint. Well, what does that mean? It means that you end up gaining more information about it. You're gaining what's called um, HPI. And that fod Lars stands for frequency, onset, duration, location, associated signs and symptoms, relief, severity. I know that I went through that quickly, but again, it's just you're trying to gain more information to really start to build your differential diagnosis list. So we always fought Lars a chief complaint. Your patient might also have a secondary chief complaint. They might have a tertiary chief complaint. They might complain about six different things. Technically, you end up fought Larsing every single one of them because you can have more than one diagnosis. Also part of that history includes systemic history. I really wanna know, do they have diabetes? Do they have high blood pressure? Do they, are, is there a chance that they're pregnant? Uh, it, what else is happening? Do they have high cholesterol, history of stroke? All of these are going to help me in diagnosing possibly some of their other problems. I want to know about their medication history because uh, is it a possibility that this can be causing dry eye side effects? Is it a possibility that it can cause changes in the back of the eye? So again, because you end up having blood flow to the back of your eyes, it's not unusual that you may end up having ocular side effects because of these systemic drugs. And then of course, I want to know about ocular history. Glasses wear, contact lens wear, ever hit in the eye, um, any type of surgery. So I previously in 2009, ended up having LASIK surgery. That would be part of that ocular history that I would want to let the doctor know. 
then you move on to your examination. So your examination is usually your entrance testing. The first thing that we do is we check how well you can see. Everyone knows, cover up your left eye. What's the lowest line that you can read? This is where we put up the big E or the lowest line. It changes, especially with some of the new computers. But um, that bottom line is usually something like TZV ECL or EOV TZ2. I want to know how well you can see the right eye, the left eye, and both eyes together. We also check how the eyes move. We check your pupils. We end up checking a screening of your side vision. So we kind of have you count. That's called confrontation fields. And that gives us a little bit of an idea of is there something happening in your peripheral vision? Because that can also give us a clue if something's happening in the brain. Your anterior segment examination is kind of the front of the eye, so your eyelids, your eyelashes, the front surface, the cornea, and also the lens that you're born with. Then the posterior segment is usually when we end up dilating your pupils, opening up nice and big. This is when very bright lights, you can't really see as well. We end up uh, putting on kind of a headset. And this is when we're looking at something called the vitreous, which is kind of the fluid filled pocket. I uh, make it analogous to a water balloon. And then the posterior segment is also including the optic nerve, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then also the retina. The retina is the thin tissue that allows you to see it's kind of the film inside the camera. Um, after we go through and we end up talking about your chief complaint, we're putting together our entire findings. And this is when we come up with your assessment or your impression, which is your diagnosis or diagnoses, and then your plan. What are we going to do to treat it? When are we going to follow up? Uh, and that ends up being kind of the four steps that go along uh, with any type of examination. So let's talk a little bit about this first uh, case that came in. This is a 21-year-old college student with bilateral red eyes. Your reference is on the left-hand side. One of the residents was nice enough to allow me to take a picture. The patient that I am uh, trying to present is going to be on the right-hand side. You can see that I ended up just green grabbing this from uh, a website. So with this, the 21-year-old college student ends up complaining about red watery eyes for two or three weeks. She reports that she's on the computer about eight hours a day. Makes sense, especially kind of in this virtual learning environment. And she has stinging and burning that's worse at the end of the day. Now you can see that I didn't fod large that entire chief complaint. We, they may not always be able to answer. So frequency, how often does it happen every day? Onset, two or three weeks ago. Duration, right, throughout the day, at least those eight hours. Location, both eyes. Associated signs and symptoms, stinging and burning. Now relief, I didn't ask the patient for relief, but that could be, well, have you, what have you tried to make it better? Have you tried to use eye drops? Have you used cold compresses? And then severity, you can say, how bad is it? Mild, moderate, severe. Scale of one to five, five being the worst. How bad is it? That could be your relief and then severity. So our exam findings, I kind of skipped over our entrance testing as far as how well she could see, et cetera, just to kind of keep us on track for time. But this is what I'm saying. If you look, you can see her eyes are very red as compared to the reference photo on, on your left. Um, with that, we would call that injection. The other thing that we do is that you can end up looking at the front surface of the eye. So if you go down to your bottom pictures, you can see that this has a green hue. This is a specific filter. It's called a cobalt blue filter. Now you're behind the slit lamp, which is that big microscope. We've put dye inside the eye. It's called sodium fluorescein. And you can tell the difference between your right picture and your left picture if you're looking down towards the bottom. So you can see those hyper kind of fluorescent spots inferiorly. Those tell me that those are dry eye spots, essentially that there's breakdown of a specific layer of the cornea. And a lot of times when it's found inferiorly like that, it could be because a patient's staring or they're not blinking their eye closed all the way. So we'll sometimes have people that also sleep with their eyes open that they don't close them all the way. But this patient essentially has dry eye spots on their cornea meaning that it's not moisturized the way that it should be. Think about this like a patch of dry skin kind of on your elbows or on your hands. So you would typically end up putting lotion, right? Vaseline, something like that on it. Well, you can't put lotion inside your eyes. So what do we do? The first thing is I obviously made that dry eye syndrome diagnosis and then it's really starting the treatment. So with that artificial tears are kind of like lotion for your eyes. Not all artificial tears are created the same. Visine and clear eyes, the things, the drops that make your eyes white don't typically moisturize the front surface of your eye. So we have specific brands that we recommend. 
and we usually start out with three or four times a day. If it's really bad, if she's saying that severity is five out of five, she's very uncomfortable, or maybe it feels as though there's a sharp pinprick to the front surface of the eye, I may also write a prescription for a steroid drop to help clear up that inflammation. I'm going to help the patient feel better sooner in addition to that. Another thing that I could prescribe is also hot compresses. We all have glands that line our upper and lower lids. They're like little tubes that allow oil to flow through them. Uh, and that oil is supposed to flow through like olive oil. There's sometimes that the oil hardens and it's like butter inside of those glands. So you end up heating them up, right? You're going to melt that butter. It's going to turn it into that olive oil consistency. Another thing that we're going to do is talk about computer habits. So when you're looking at the computer, anytime that you're switching to a new screen, blink your eyes, conscientiously blink, because anytime we're concentrating on something, we tend to do the wide-eyed stare, so we don't miss anything. That happens with reading, computer, watching television. So in this situation, it's just an interesting way how, you know, you might think, oh, the patient might have what's called allergic conjunctivitis, um, where they come in, and usually that is going to be itchy, that they want to rub. What else are they allergic to? So I probably also ask that in my history. Do you have any allergies? Are your eyes itchy? Do you have a new cat? Also, you would think about what time is it during the year? Is this during spring or during fall where allergies are worse? And that would be considered a differential diagnosis when you're really looking at this patient's chief complaint and you're gathering your exam data to really put together your clinical thought process and how you're going to end up treating this patient. All right. Let's move on to the next one. So this one's the second case. So this is a new patient that doesn't have any ocular complaints. He came in because we told him to come in. So no visual or ocular complaints. Um, front health of the eye looks good. Pressure inside the eye, that's called intraocular pressure, or IOP that I've written here. So we can end up measuring this a couple of different ways. Some of you might know this as kind of that air puff test where you want to fall out of the chair a little bit. The first time I ever had that air puff test, I was in optometry school as a first year, and I never knew what anybody was talking about when they were saying the air puff test. But Yes, it is an interesting way for us to measure pressure inside the eye. It is not the gold standard, but it's a good screening. There's also the blue light that comes really close to the front surface of your eye. That's another way that we can test it. There's also a, a new instrument, it's called eye care, and it kind of just bounces off the front part of the cornea where you don't feel it very much. But all of those are different ways that we can check pressure inside the eye. And that is because you have fluid that bathes the contents within the eye that it needs to provide oxygen and nutrients because it's not vascularized. That being said, we open up the patient's pupils nice and big. We take a look in the back of the eye, and this is what we see. So these are actually from a picture of a patient I saw last week. So when we look in the back of the eye, you can end up seeing that there's something that kind of looks like a donut, right? So in the donut, you uh, have blood vessels that are coming out of it. This is your optic nerve. It's an extension from the brain. It's one of the 12 cranial nerves. It's actually cranial nerve two. Where it inserts into the back of the eye, it looks like a donut. We always grade the kind of circle in the middle or the scooped up part or the hole of the donut. This is also where we assess those blood vessels that I talked about, that it's the only part of the body that you can directly see blood vessels. And this is why it mimics or it ends up showing us if there are changes systemically because we can look at those blood vessels because it's telling us or reflecting what's happening in the blood vessels throughout the rest of the body. Now with this, right, we ended up looking and I said, okay, this patient is a glaucoma suspect, meaning I'm suspicious that the patient either has glaucoma or that they might develop it over time. So what do I do? Do I diagnose them that day with glaucoma? Most often the answer to that is no, that they need further baseline testing to determine do I need to treat this? So here, I'm just showing you some reference photos. This is also a patient that I saw last week. So you can see these optic nerves. And when you look at them, can you tell that the circle or the hole of the donut is much smaller? So the white part ends up being much smaller as compared to the previous picture that we had seen. But again, this is just a reference photo to kind of just show you that there ends up being variation. And what are we looking at? during our exam to determine is this on our differential diagnosis list. So I blew it up a little bit here for you. So when we're looking at it, your black circle or your black oval ends up being the optic nerve. 
right? So the optic nerve, again, is that extension from the brain into the back of the eye. And then we end up looking at the cup. And again, it's not the best job that I can do, especially with PowerPoint, but I'm looking at, again, that small circle or the more white part of it. Now that white part is called the cup. There's nothing there, actually. There's no tissue that's there. I'm actually concerned about the meat part of the donut. That is axons or cables that take what you see and send it to the brain. That connection has to be there in order for you to see well and check your visual field. So if you end up having damage to kind of those axons or to that cable, right, you're going to end up having changes in your visual field over time. So again, we're going to go back. So here's your case two. There's that new patient without your ocular complaints. Let's blow up these optic nerves a little bit. Can you appreciate the difference between the size of this cup as compared to the previous reference patient? So you can see that the whole of that donut is very large. Now, is it possible that the patient was born that way? Absolutely. But again, based on studies, when we practice evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice, we know that an individual who has an enlarged cup is more likely to develop glaucoma. So we end up doing testing. So again, this is a test. This is called an OCT or an optical coherence tomography. There is a um, database of individuals that absolutely do not have glaucoma, and it tells us where does this patient fit into the database. So in this situation, most times red is bad, especially towards the bottom, meaning that there's thinning or damage. If it's yellow, it's borderline, which would only be normal in about 5% of the population, and green means good or go. So when I come down and I'm looking at the second part of this, it's the RNFL deviation map, there are circles that are drawn in. That's the algorithm from the computer program of this laser scan that's here. But then it also shows me that there's thinning. So if you look on the left-hand side of your scan, you can see that there ends up being red. So I'm going to see if I can put my mouse here, right in here. You can see that there's red, and this is superior temporal in the right eye. I know that there's thinning or damage that's there. That is not normal. We don't want thinning or damage. When you end up looking kind of inferior temporal, there's yellow, meaning that it's borderline. This would only be normal in about 5% of the population. When you come over to the left eye, you can start to see that there's also this borderline damage, kind of superior temporal, inferior temporal. Also, some of this interpretation as we move down towards the bottom, this ends up being a specific um, type of quadrants that we're looking at, and it gives us an average of what's called the retinal nerve fiber layer. So again, green would be good, meaning that there's no thinning. Yellow is borderline, where it would be only normal in about 5% of the population. Red is outside normal limits, or that would only be normal in less than 1% of the population, telling me that there is damage in this uh, patient. Go ahead and close that annotate. This is a different scan. It's kind of the sister scan to that OCT. This is called a ganglion cell analysis. This tells me about a specific layer of the retina. Remember, the retina is the tissue that allows you to see. It's the film inside the camera. That there's also thinning in a specific layer called the ganglion cell layer. So here, again, red is bad. Yellow is borderline. Green would be good. So we can also see that there's damage specifically in this layer. And then the final completion as part of this is we check the patient's side vision or peripheral vision because like I said, the optic nerve is the cable that takes what you see and sends it to the brain. So here we're looking to see, are there any other or new blind spots that shouldn't be there? Now, when we look at this, um, right here, you end up seeing a blind spot, it's dark. This is your left eye. This is your right eye. This is your normal blind spot. Everybody has a normal blind spot. I'm looking to see, though, if this patient has any blind spots that shouldn't be there other than their normal natural blind spot. This patient actually looks pretty good when I uh, look at their scan that I'm not seeing any type of um, defects or what we end up calling visual field defects. And that's a good thing. And that is because we want to kind of catch any damage before you end up having loss of your visual field. So we're trying to make this diagnosis sooner rather than later. So with this, do we end up diagnosing this patient with glaucoma? So I kind of gave you the originals to start with that I said that they were a glaucoma suspect. I'm suspicious that they might end up having this diagnosis. I end up doing the testing. I put it together with my knowledge base and it's 
the patient has damage. So what do we have to do? We need to lower the pressure inside the eye to stop the progression so that our patient doesn't slowly go blind. And the way that we do that is the only thing we can change is the pressure inside the eye. You can do that with two different ways. You can start topical ophthalmic eye drops or sometimes a less invasive laser can also be utilized just like you would put them in the slit lamp and that I talked about before. So in this situation, we ended up diagnosing this patient with glaucoma. I end up managing them. I see them every three months to check their pressure. I end up repeating those two scans I showed you at least yearly to make sure that there is no further progression because that's what we're trying to stop. All right. How about a third case? This came in a couple of months ago. This is a 35-year-old woman uh, who can, comes in with flashes of light bilaterally. Flashes of light can be from headaches, especially migraines. Sometimes it could be the retina um, where there's traction on the retina and it's stimulating the cells. In this situation, if you're taking a quick peek here at those optic nerves, you're thinking, hmm, they don't look like the other pictures Alyssa just showed me, right? And that is because there's something else happening. This patient reports with flashes of light in both eyes, worse in the left as compared to the right for a week. Those uh, flashes of light occur with a headache and dimming of vision where it's kind of like they, it goes gray for about 10 minutes, they can't really see as well, and then their normal vision comes back. She also reports that she experiences pressure behind the eyes. Her medical history is positive for a copper intrauterine device uh, for birth control for four years. That means it is not hormonal. Uh, and she is, as far as when you look at her stature, larger than ideal BMI, meaning that she's overweight. Our entrance testing is all normal, meaning she sees well, the eyes move, the pupils are normal, pressure is normal. But when we end up dilating the pupils and we take a look in the back, this is one of those that you kind of get the, ooh, that's not a great diagnosis. This is going to have to um, really entail further testing because this is telling me that there is something probably going on inside the brain. And that is because remember that your cranial nerve to your optic nerve is an extension from the brain into the back of the eye. So what we're seeing in this photo is what we call bilateral disc edema or optic nerve head swelling. So there's fluid that is making your edges less distinct. Um, more specifically, you're seeing something called axoplasmic stasis, meaning the fluid that uh, traverses these different axons is getting stuck. And that is why you kind of see that it's this fluffy looking nerve. So again, this is our reference photo. You can kind of see those optic nerves are nice and distinct. They don't look very whitish on the edge. And then when we end up moving to our patient, you can see that there is a big difference that's here. So now I have to be thinking, okay, well, what could be causing this? And these are the scary ones because it can be something or it can be nothing. So with this, here's a great question. What do you think is the diagnosis for case three? Is it glaucoma like the previous case? Is it a tumor? Is it something called papilledema, which is increased intracranial pressure? Is it cataracts, macular degeneration, or you have no idea? Okay, we'll leave the poll up for a few more seconds. If you haven't voted, go ahead and pick or just say you have no idea. <laughs> Good. So people said tumor on the occipital lobe, papilledema. You know, I think that those are your two best differential. And that is because when you end up looking at this, you, you, there's increased intracranial pressure. Well, what can end up causing increased cranial pressure? A couple of different things. One of them being a space occupying lesion, also known as a tumor. There are different type of tumors. Another is sometimes you can just have an increase in the amount of fluid. So a CSF that is being produced. Uh, we can sometimes see something that's called idiopathic pathic intracranial hypertension, or also known as pseudotumor cerebri, in patients that are sometimes fertile females, uh, meaning that they're women of childbearing age, usually that they're overweight. They think it might have to do um, with pressure sometimes coming from abdominal obesity, uh, could be one of them. Another aspect could be 
could be a side effect of oral medication. So something like Accutane or isotretinoin can end up causing this. Uh, sometimes oral corticosteroids or glucocorticoids can cause this. Also, it's not unusual that sometimes we can end up seeing this in oral contraceptives, that this can end up causing changes in the amount of fluid or of CSF in the brain. So I showed you a picture of an OCT and a glaucoma patient, and that is really the purpose of why OCT came out, but you can also tell severe elevation when we utilize this instrument of optical coherence tomography. I like to say that this is kind of an MRI, specifically either of the optic nerve or of the retina, but you can kind of compare this to our previous patient, especially if you're looking in the center right here, that that um, neuroretinal rim thickness is literally what we say off the charts, and that is because there's so much fluid that's there, the algorithm or the program can't read it appropriately, but it tells us that there is a lot of fluid around that optic nerve. So um, question four would be, kind of already gave you that answer, um, was can this be caused by systemic medication? And the answer to that is yes, it can be. So, all right, what is our diagnosis? I diagnose this as papilledema. This, um, these pictures were compliments of the resident who was great enough to share them with me. So papilledema is it due to increased intracranial pressure. More specifically, the probably the more correct diagnosis just right now um, in this situation is bilateral disc edema, meaning we don't necessarily know that it's caused because of increased intracranial pressure. However, because it's both eyes, most people are going to call it papilledema. But now we end up needing to rule out what is the cause. So I'm going to ask her about her medication history. She shared with us that she has a copper IUD, so we know that there's no hormones associated with that. Uh, not taking any of those high-risk medications that I would think that this finding papilledema would be associated with that. So now I have to determine, does this patient just have increase in CSF due to obesity? Um, uh, or is it a space occupying lesion that this ends up being a tumor, which could be pretty bad. There's also changes in the brain. Sometimes you can end up having Arnold Chiari syndrome that can also end up causing a flow issue. So this patient is emergent. They need to go to the emergency department ASAP. And the reason for that is they end up needing neuroimaging. And the neuroimaging that they need is an MRI, again, looking for that space occupying lesion, and something that's called an MRV. And that looks specifically at the venous system because we want to make sure that there's not a problem in the drainage um, of that CSF. So this is going to look for um, uh, venous venous sinus thrombosis is there. So cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, that there ends up being a blockage essentially of that outflow. If both of those come back normal, that's the best case scenario. Terrific. The patient then needs a lumbar puncture to then determine the opening pressure of the CSF. And that's usually what we're looking for is usually um, either 20 centimeters or greater than uh, 200 millimeters of opening pressure that tells us that there's an overabundance of CSF. And that is why we're seeing this fluid um, around the optic nerve. So in this situation, you can see that really how optometry can be part of that interprofessional team, that neuro-ophthalmology or neurology also needs to be involved. The emergency room may also be involved. Um, and then it comes down to, well, what is the diagnosis and how is it treated? For her, is it weight management, right? That it's typically recommended 10% of your body mass uh, as part of weight loss. Is this something that you then become or get them involved in bariatric medicine? Is that going to be the best option as far as having a different type of bariatric surgery to help them lose weight to increase their um, healthy lifestyle over their entire lifetime. So there are so many different ways that you can end up working with these patients. So, you know, just the case roundup, we talked about history. Medication would be part of history, but I just wanted to show you why it's so important of having a good grasp of pharmacology because all of the different side effects that can happen. Um, also, if there are polypharmacy, meaning that they're taking more than one medication, what are those drug-drug interactions? Uh, we sometimes have patients who are taking glaucoma drops that are called beta blockers, that they end up having CNS side effects, that they are very fatigued because of it. Maybe it ends up affecting their um, heart rate. So all of these are going to be important and why we concentrate a lot on pharmacology, both from a systemic standpoint and from an ocular standpoint.
You have your examination findings that you're collecting the data to be able to interpret it, to be able to come up with your assessment or your diagnosis or right, diagnoses. And then your plan. How do you end up treating these patients? How do you manage these patients? So you can see that there ends up being a wide array of different things that can come into your practice or come into the office. And that it's not always just about giving them glasses, which is better one or two. Yes, most people think about optometrists in that aspect about being good refractionists, but there's a whole lot more, especially when we're talking about the importance of ocular health over their entire lifetime. So let's talk about optometry schools. In the United States, there's 23. So that's in the continental United States and one in Puerto Rico. There's also two in Canada. The numbers that I'm going to present to you are from those in the United States and Puerto Rico. Uh, the information I got is from ASCO, which is the Association of Schools and Colleges of Optometry. So right now, uh, there are 7,200 approximately optomet or optometry students. That's first through fourth year, where most of them do end up uh, utilizing financial aid or student loans in order to help pay tuition and have those living expenses. Most times, uh, average debt coming out of optometry school, usually over four years, is about $180,000. Most programs are going to be four years, so you'll see a lot um, optometrists go to undergrad and have a degree, so four years of undergrad and then four years of optometry school. That is true, although I will tell you at PCO, we do have a three-year accelerated program that it is three years year-round. Um, it is for highly qualified students. You do graduate with an OD degree uh, in three years. NECO, which is um, in Boston, also has a three-year program, but that's for individuals who hold other typically doctoral degrees. So a PhD, um, they might end up having an MD or a DO. Um, also, people who hold professional degrees from other countries, there are usually other special programs at your different optometry schools. Your requirements for getting into optometry school really do differ by the school. Um, there, is, there are prerequisites. Usually it's going to be your typical science classes, those that go along with your other pre-health professions, such as anatomy, physiology, biochem, um, microbiology, statistics, calculus, um, organic chemistry, physics. All of that is usually going to be part of the prereqs. OATs are the optometry admissions tests. Uh, some schools require them. Some schools also accept GREs. There have also been a movement over the past couple of months to get away from that standardized testing that some uh, colleges or schools of optometry do not require that as part of their admissions. Also, shadowing. While shadowing may be required for some schools, it's not required for all schools. However, I will tell you that it usually comes strongly recommended uh, just because it makes you a stronger applicant. So if you're interested in optometry, I'm going to send you to the ASCO website, which is optometriceducation.org. Uh, there's a lot of good information there. And then there's a specific tab where it says students or future students that you can click on any of the links that are there and find out more about specific colleges. Where are you interested in going? Do you want to stay local? Um, and each a school or college of optometry might have a different, I'm going to say, concentration. So PCO is usually very heavily ocular disease. I will tell you that SUNY in New York does a very good job, especially with binocular and pediatric vision. Um, so each one might have its own little niche. But for the most part, where do you want to go? I will tell you that um, it really is kind of up to you. You're going to end up getting a great education no matter where you choose to go. You know, I only applied to one school, and that might be my biggest hang up. What, an, what had I wish I'd done differently? I am super proud of my education. I felt as though I was very well prepared to enter the profession in the workforce. However, there are some times that really the biggest I will say competitor when you're looking at different schools now are scholarships. Can you get scholarships? And what is going to be the best bang for your buck? That might be what you really want to look at, especially if you're a highly competitive student. I will tell you that our three-year scholars program ends up cutting off a year of tuition. Uh, that is why some students are really interested in it because you save approximately fifty or $60,000 between tuition and living costs. But again, you really have to put your nose to the grindstone in that effect. 
but um, more and more schools are kind of offering scholarships to get those more well qualified students to really get them to choose you, the student, to choose them the school. To get into optometry school, there is a centralized enrollment service. It's called Optom OptomCast. Uh, again, you can apply to all of the schools with just one application, or many schools, I should say, with one application. That original fee is $180 for one school, and then each additional school is $70 on top of that. So if you're going to apply to two schools, $250, $320, $390, etc. cetera. Um, but it makes it a lot easier that you can kind of fill out this centralized application rather than sending in applications to each separate optometry school. And every optometry school in the United States and Puerto Rico does participate in this uh, management service. So that uh, website is optomcast.org, and that has good information if you want to look a little bit more at that. Student profile, uh, there were 24, approximately 100 students that applied for admission, uh, and that was in 2019. About 1,900 students did enter that first year class, so that's about a 75, 76% acceptance rate. On average, each individual applied to 4.75 schools. The average undergrad GPA is a 3.36, with 22 years old being the median age of when people are applying to optometry school. And you can see just as it's reflected, about 70% of those applicants were female, 29% of those applicants were male. And again, this is taken from uh, ASCO data from 2019-2020. So this would be the entering class of 2019. So what type of advice do I have to provide to you or give to you? How about for undergrad? You know, check your prerequisites for what school you're interested in. Most of them are going to be quite similar, where some of them are strongly recommended and some of them are required. Think about your letters of recommendation. Like I told you, I didn't really have that strict science undergraduate major, so I panicked a little bit of what was I going to do because I didn't feel very close to my professors because I wasn't really struggling. You know, why is an A? or a B plus student going to come to office hours, go to office hours. Even if you have 100% in the course, go to office hours. You know, you're always thinking ahead. Just introduce yourself, you know, show up in class. Don't necessarily sit right in the front, but, you know, that they see you, that they can recognize you. So then that way, when you end up asking for a letter of recommendation, they recognize you. They feel comfortable saying, yes, they go to class. These are their scores. Um, if you are in a lab, right, that you end up doing research for a professor, even better. Better, uh, because they're going to know you on that more personal level. Most universities also do have a pre-professional committee that they will write you a letter from an, an overall umbrella. Just realize that you will have to get letters um, from your college professors to go into that pre-professional committee. How about participation in extracurricular activities? Having well-rounded students always is going to be a, a goal. Um, that's not saying that you have to be involved in every single thing, but choose something that you can also talk about outside of academics, whether that means that you're a tutor, that you're involved in um, a different type of charity. Are you involved in a sorority or a fraternity? Are you involved in a pre-professional health club? All of those are going to look very good on the application. I know some individuals that are trying to get in to physician assistant school or trying to get into med school, also become EMTs or that they'll volunteer in the hospital, anything to really kind of make you stand out. And I can't stress shadowing enough. It looks very good. It also helps you feel more confident in your decision of where, what you want to do or how you want to practice in the future. So from my standpoint, I knew I didn't want to go to medical school. I knew I didn't want to be a surgeon. I didn't want to be an ophthalmologist. So I was then saying, well, what other health profession can I enter? And I am so happy in my profession. I love my job. I love my work. But if you are not sure that you're like, oh, do I want to do what Alyssa Coyne does and be an optometrist? Or do I I want to go and do surgery? Do I want to be an ophthalmologist? We'll shadow each of them and see what are you more interested in. How about the application process? 
can't stress it enough, apply early. I ended up putting in my application like August 1st. It was even before the application cycle opened. You can end up entering your scores at different points throughout it. You don't have to have everything done at one lump sum, but most times uh, admissions are rolling. So you want to make sure that you're getting your information in early. Uh, sometimes you might be waitlisted or that you end up being accepted to your dream school. So start applying early, have a timeline of when you want to have information done, especially when you need to end up taking the OAT. You know, do you want to take that in December of your senior year of college? You might want to push it up a little bit, maybe September or October. Make sure you proofread your applications. I can't stress this enough. Proofread, 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 have somebody else read it. Small little grammar mistakes do make a difference. And if you're really interested, make sure you visit the schools. Remember that that's going to be your home for about the next two and a half or three years. And the reason I say that is your last year, you're out on rotations uh, and it could be all over America, but you have to feel home there. You know, just because you're saying, oh, they have the best national boards part one um, scores or passage rate. You know, if you don't feel at home there, it's probably not the best place for you. So not only do you, does the school have to pick you, you have to pick the school. And then finally, that goes along with, um, you know, acceptance. Make sure that it feels right is really the big thing. Ask about scholarships. A lot of times you, you'll end up getting scholarship information with your acceptance letter. You know, always reach out later on to see, can they give you more money? Um, I will know that some students will say, hey, I got a scholarship for this amount at this other school. I'm really interested in coming to your school. Are there any other merit scholarships? You can kind of play that game. Um, just be careful, sometimes the admissions office can, can get annoyed here and there. But again, you know, you're trying to get as much money as you possibly can. And then the last is consider, do you want to subspecialize? Do you want to do a residency? When you end up entering practice, do you want to concentrate on ocular disease like I do? Do you want to do those specialty contact lens fits uh, for individuals who end up having keratoconus or other uh, corneal diseases? Do you want to work with individuals who have limited sight and really improve their quality of life by being a low vision specialist? So also start to think about things like that even early when you're applying and or first or second year of optometry school so that you can end up building your resume to make you a very strong candidate for highly competitive residency programs. All right, I just went through that pretty quickly. Thank you so much for your time. Please feel free to email me. I'm going to stay on so that we can answer a couple of questions. My email is acoyne, A-C-O-Y-N-E, at salis.edu. Wonderful. And we are nearing our end. So I will go ahead and go over the um, wrap up presentation exactly at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So until then, we can go through a couple of the questions that got put into the Q&A. Aster, are you ready? Sure. Um, the email address is acoin, A-C-O-Y-N-E, at salus, S-A-L-U-S, dot E-D-U. Let me see if I can actually type that in there. I'll put it in the chat for anybody who needs it. Perfect. Thank you. Aster, you want to ask some questions? Um, yeah, sure. I'm sorry about that. Um, so our first question was, so you did speak a little bit about being an undergraduate who didn't have a typical degree path in, as like a biology major. What advice would you have specifically for students who are considering going to maybe optometry and maybe want to pursue another degree path? Would it be better for them to stay with biology or do you think there are other things they can do to accommodate these other, other interests? Sure. I will tell you that we, most of our students that do enter do have biology degrees. I'm not saying that that's a requirement. It's just very popular. I'm actually very appreciative that I had a little bit of a different route. And that is because I took classes in genetics and in epidemiology that really helped me look at different studies and be able to assess studies on a different level than just that typical biology degree. For individuals that may be having, I'm going to say a non-traditional route. Just make sure you're looking at the prereqs associated with it. And that is because um, 
you are going to still have some of those science classes where I was able to fit the science classes into my transcript and into my degree program. Uh, there are sometimes that individuals who graduate with like an engineering degree or a nursing degree might have to end up taking classes, additional classes um, as a non matriculating student in order to meet the prereqs for the optometry school or school schools that you're applying to. So I would just say it's fine if you have a non-traditional route. Um, it's just that if you're interested, make sure that you're kind of keeping track and that you're meeting the standards of saying, yes, I have anatomy and I have a physiology class. Yes, I have a microbiology class. Yes, I have a statistics class. Um, and just when you are kind of utilizing different, um, I'm going to say wiggle room within your own um, curriculum of what you need to attain your degree, that you're choosing specific courses that you know are going to meet your prereqs. I actually think nursing is a great undergrad for optometry just because of the amount of like pharmacology. I always say that. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome advice. Thanks for sharing. Um, we did get a question for what do you what advice do you have for pre optometry students in undergrad, especially how things have changed given COVID. Um, and one person asked specifically, do you have any advice for approaching optometrists to gain shadowing considering COVID? Sure. Um, I will tell you that most of our classes are virtual right now. We do have in-person labs. We do have in-person clinic. Usually our first and second years are in clinic quite early. However, what we've done is really, it's only our third years. Um, our second years will enter clinic actually later this month. So we limited it to the student, the doctor, and then the patient because of trying to limit contact. Now, as far as how that's going to end up affecting our next incoming classes, I think that we've actually been quite innovative with how we've trying to take a typical lecture rather than just standing up in front of the class and just giving you the information where we've recorded lectures. We've then done virtual recitations where we'll also utilize things um, like a hoot or top hat, other type of um, kind of that automatic feedback where we use that quiz style to, to give you that assessment. Um, as far as approaching optometrists, I will tell you that in the very beginning of COVID, probably through July or August, uh, that it was everyone was being very overly conscientious. No one extra was allowed like in the buildings or in the offices. I don't want to say it's loosened up a little bit, but I think especially now with the COVID vaccination and more people being vaccinated, that the masking associated with it, you might have a little bit of an easier time trying to get into a practice. Um, what I would say is if you're at home in the summer, you know, you can call around cold call people or you can even contact the manager. I will usually say that most optometrists that I know are open and willing to having students come in. Big thing is if you go in to do an observation or a shadow, please do not wear like jeans. Um, there is actually a very large community on Facebook. It's called ODs on Facebook. Uh, and I will, I kind of, um, hang on the walls there a little bit just because a lot of our students are on there. But while I'm lurking, I will sometimes see the feedback that they'll say that they had a high schooler, that they had a college student come in and that they were wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Please don't do that. You can always ask what is the appropriate wear beforehand if you need to be business professional, business casual, or maybe even scrubs. But um, it's okay for you to cold call, talk to the optometrist, you can email. Um, to make that happen. If I had to make an assumption, I would say maybe this summer people will be a little bit more open to having a student in their practice. Um, the other thing is how many hours do you want? And you can say, oh, I was thinking about coming in four hours a week, or I would come in Monday on Mondays for the summer, or I would come in four Mondays overall. Kind of let them have an expectation. The other thing that you can do that also looks very good is that you might get a summer job as an ophthalmic tech where you are working with the optometrist and you could get paid for it um, as, as part of your learning experience where you're gathering some of that entrance data that I talked about as part of the exam. Great advice, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what was the toughest challenge you faced through, throughout your optometry journey? Great question. Um, you know, I try to give you all of this information about what optometrists can do and kind of what we learn. I think I really wasn't prepared for just how intensive the curriculum is. And that is because we do learn a lot about systemic disease. We learn a lot about neuroanatomy. Um, 
And it was teaching myself how to study appropriately. I used to be the student who could go to class. I would sit there and I could just listen, look at my notes for 15 minutes and take an exam and do well. That was not happening in optometry school strictly because of the sheer amount of information that's provided. So I will tell you is I had to teach myself how to study the right way and what worked for me. Thank you so much. And for the final question, do you have any final advice for our students? I want to say that I love my job. I love being an optometrist. That doesn't mean that it's for everybody. So when you're considering any type of uh, profession in the medical field, realize that you have to make yourself happy um, and making sure that as you are going through, you know, school's always going to be a struggle. It's for a very short amount of time. It is not your entire future. So I always looked at when you are going to a professional school, that is your job. Um, it is your job to go to class, to go to labs, and then to study. So while your friends who graduated with you are teaching or are at their engineering firms, that's their job. Your job is to study. It's for a short amount of time. It flies by um, and also get to know your classmates because you are going to attend school with wonderful people. Wow, thank you so much again for joining us, Dr. Coyne. That was an amazing um, presentation, so much great insight. And I think that all of our students are gonna take this with them on their journey. So thank you again for joining us. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Have a, awesome, we're gonna go through um, just a couple wrap up things for all of our students. Um, just if you guys are interested in um, taking the post shadowing assessment and getting a certificate that verifies your virtual shadowing hours with us today, you um, can take an assessment on our website. So on uh, First things first, uh, just a little reflection. We just had an amazing presentation, uh, but you guys are going to be applying to various programs. Um, it's really great to kind of just, you know, take a snapshot of how you're feeling right now and um, what brought you here today to the session. Um, what are three major takeaways that you got from today's presentation and what do you want to learn more about? So feel free to um, like comment in the chat any of these responses. Uh, feel free to write it down for yourself personally. You guys don't have to turn this in to prove that you were here today. However, if you do want to get some recognition, you can send in any pieces of writing to Prehealth Shadowing at prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. You can send in articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories to be reviewed by our editor-in-chief. If you guys are interested in being a part of this student-led nonprofit international organization, you definitely can get involved. It's really easy. All you have to do is go to our website and sign up. That's all you have to do. There is a training that lasts for about an hour and then you can start on the various projects that we have going on. If you guys are interested in obtaining a leadership role within our student organization, you can apply on our website and fill out the team member application. Again, uh, if you guys are financially able to donate at this time, please do so. We humbly ask that if you can donate $5 for joining us today, um, that is very helpful as we are working to keep our website from crashing. Uh, the more students that we get, the uh, harder it is for our server to stay up. And oftentimes students are interrupted midway through their post shadowing assessments because the website has crashed. We are looking to increase accessibility to anybody around around the world who is interested in joining us. So please help us in uh, starting this initiative with pre-health shadowing. Thank you. Alrighty, so now if you guys are interested in getting your post shadowing certificate, you're gonna go to our website, prehealthshadowing.com. You're gonna have two tries and 20, 30 minutes, excuse me, two tries and 30 minutes to get above a 70% on the post shadowing assessment. Once you do so, you will uh, get to download your certificate immediately. You can also find your certificate at all times in your profile under the certificates tab. If you guys have any questions about that, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Be sure to sign up for future sessions. You guys can sign up on our website. And if you guys miss any part of today's session, feel free to go to our YouTube channel or our website, freehealthshadowing.com, to watch any of our previous sessions completely for free. You guys are more than welcome to take the post-shadowing assessment at any time after the uh, 
session has been recorded uh, or held live. So you guys are still able to obtain your certificate even after uh, the session has aired, essentially. You guys can sign up for any future sessions on our website. Uh, thanks for joining us all. Um, I hope to see you at our future virtual shadowing sessions. If you guys have any questions, um, our student team will be sticking around. Uh, feel free to chat. Thanks again for coming. This is the end of the virtual shadowing session. If you guys don't have any um, questions or anything, I invite you to disconnect from the call.